the next session coming up, uh, which I'm really looking forward to, is uh, being given by Jefferson Bailey of the Internet Archive, an old friend of CNI's. Um, uh, he's going to talk about um, the work that the Internet Archive is doing to support um, perpetual access to open scholarship. Um, and uh, I'm without further ado, I'm going to just hand it off to uh, Jefferson to take it away. Welcome, Jefferson. Great. Thank you, Cliff. And thank you to the CNI team for the opportunity to talk. And of course, thanks to everyone for attending and hope to see you at the next in-person one soon. Uh, so as Cliff mentioned, I'm uh, uh, from Internet Archive, and I'm going to talk about our Internet Archive Scholar project. Um, so let's get the slides going here. Uh, so it's our 25th anniversary this year, uh, Internet Archive. Of course, also uh, it's December, so it's our end of the year fundraising campaign as a public service nonprofit. So uh, feel free to click and give if you like the talk. Um, otherwise, I think as most people know, uh, our, our mission is universal access to all knowledge. Um, here's the sort of uh, stats of all the stuff that we have slide, which people usually ask about. Um, so, you know, lots of lots of millions that you can dig through there, uh, but we'll be talking today or I'll be talking today about uh, our work on uh, scholarly preservation, which is a somewhat more recent endeavor than some of our other areas of archiving. Um, and some stats around there are at the bottom and I'll talk more about them uh, on uh, on later slides and what uh, those numbers mean. So Internet Archive Scholar is sort of our project name. And you know what were the goals that we came up with this? I would say in 2017 or 2018, we basically decided that we needed to do a better job of archiving and providing perpetual access to scholarly materials. We, of course, already had plenty in the archive at that time um, through digitization, web harvesting, uh, user uploads, things like that. Uh, but we did not have sort of intentional collecting, uh, partnership, product development, all those sorts of areas, uh, programs. And so that was something we decided to pursue. And this is me updating on that a couple of years later. Uh, so, you know, one goal that we all often try to do is using IA's open infrastructure for public good and access to knowledge. We do own and operate all our own data centers. So we're not using any commercial cloud services. We are a nonprofit, as I mentioned. Uh, so I think that's an important aspect. Uh, but for this specific project, uh, we sort of surveyed the landscape and wanted to see what we were good at doing already and how that could be applied to preserving uh, scholarly materials. So instead of specialized archiving services, we wanted to take uh, sort of open scholarship automation and apply that uh, to some of our existing technologies, especially around collecting the web. Uh, and instead of specialized curation uh, methods, we wanted to build tools that identified scholarly objects where they lived, uh, identify the metadata associated with them, which were of course often associated with DOIs or registries or other things, uh, and bring those two to, together for better, not just preservation and access, but for better discoverability. You know, what were some of the challenges that we felt like uh, we could help try to mitigate? Uh, the print to digital transition in scholarly publications has had Custodial challenges, many publications and journals uh, don't really think of preservation. Many of them are volunteer driven. They might have a short uh, lifespan uh, and not really think about long-term access. Uh, the sort of traditional curation methods that we used to use for deciding what to preserve or what to you know, purchase um, in, in subscription deals uh, doesn't scale as well, especially uh, with the proliferation of, of the ease of creating journals with systems like OJS or, or web-only publications. Uh, traditional expectations around uh, authors depositing into repositories is gotten a lot more complex, especially when there's a lot more to a scholarly output than just the version of record article. Uh, preservation is increasingly a problem for long tail publications for uh, non-North American Europe uh, uh, publishing entities. Uh, for smaller humanities, non-STEM publications. Uh, and of course, uh, things that are web only or completely born digital are even more at risk uh, uh, for long-term access. Uh, what are some of the access challenges? Well, we know we have about a billion PDFs in the Wayback Machine. We think about 
7% of those are scholarly materials. Uh, how do you find those? You have to know the URL. So that's not a very good access method. Uh, the web collection is not well searchable uh, at scale, let's say. There are small thing curated collections that have ample metadata and help. Um, scholarly outputs are all over the web. Of course, it's not just publishers. It's also conference proceedings in institutional repositories. There's YouTube videos like this will be there somewhere uh, at some point. So I think uh, the diversity of platforms uh, to which people can publish scholarly outputs uh, has created challenges. There's no great quality assurance or quality uh, control mechanisms for any of this. Uh, and prior to this project, we didn't have really targeted harvesting uh, methods. So we came up with two approaches, a sort of top-down and a bottom-up uh, concept. One, the top-down is that we actually harvest and archive uh, a whole lot of uh, persistent identifier uh, systems, uh, which is great in the open infrastructure. So we do cross-rep data site DOIs, uh, Zenodo, uh, registries, uh, other metadata sources, manifest, outputs from other aggregators. So we can take this whole ecosystem of not just the actual published items, but the metadata around them, which often contain the URL and the location of the actual output. Uh, and we can use those as signals of what to go out uh, and archive. We can, of course, archive journal websites and those, those kind of things too. Um, but I think there's a, a larger sort of top-down uh, ecosystem that can be used as a signaling mechanism uh, to what to go out and archive. And this is all, of course, on the uh, public web, right? Uh, the bottom up is that, of course, we're already collecting a lot of things at scale. We're digitizing a lot of things at scale. We're having uh, you know, content deposits from institutions into the archive, uh, and we can assess those to determine whether they are scholarly materials if, if that isn't already known. So we built uh, sort of the bottom up is take what we already have and determine whether it's a scholarly output and then add it into um, our sort of search and discovery uh, platforms. Uh, so that's using machine learning and automated tools basically. Uh, and then of course, there's sort of the, the more partnership forever approach. Uh, partners, build partnerships, build services, all the code or APIs around this uh, is, is open source. Uh, the, you know, we're using our own infrastructure, which is of course owned by a nonprofit entity. We can also make all this content discoverable because it's open, it's OA material. We can make it discoverable in other discovery services, which is great. Uh, we can uh, include the ability to deposit and redistrib redistribute this content into sort of distributed digital preservation systems through partnerships. And we work closely already with many national libraries around the world. And so we can leverage those relationships both to provide them with content they may not be getting, as well as if they have open content that they're interested in having other people provide access to or preservation of, uh, we can do that as well. Uh, so a lot of these uh, sort of indices and services will be familiar to many, Crossref, PubMed, Artsiv, other aggregators like uh, Unpaywall and Core. We have worked closely with like the Semantic Scholar Project. Uh, we used Microsoft's academic graph before it shut down uh, and worked closely with uh, folks like DOAJ and DOAB and places like that. Um, so this is sort of using either partnerships or their own open APIs uh, to get metadata, to archive it, to interpret it, uh, to determine uh, what, what can be archived. Uh, so as an archive, we of course archive all of this metadata that we're getting as well. Uh, that's proven useful in some cases for researchers or other projects uh, who don't want to uh, sort of abuse someone's API and are looking more for a database dump. Uh, and so uh, I think that's one side benefit that's come out of the project is that we can provide uh, persistent access uh, also to metadata stores. And of course, many of these services are also doing that themselves, but uh, you know, more copies, more places uh, for the better. What are some of the infrastructure uh, goals around the project? As I mentioned, we do uh, own and operate everything. Um, we have a lot of automation, not just in the web harvesting, but in the, in the content processing and indexing. Um, but we also, of course, do a lot of uh, manual uh, you know, assurance or interpretation of that material. So it's really trying to solve some of the, the the human resource challenges around working at the scale uh, that we're trying to collect at. 
uh, for the metadata that we, the cat back in catalog that supports Internet Archive Scholar. It is a sort of wiki style um, catalog that can be publicly edited. Um, so you create an account and things like that. But basically we have journals and individual authors that can go in and correct uh, the metadata. Of course, we're consuming metadata from like DOIs or whatnot, uh, and that is often incomplete. And uh, so we're pro also providing a mechanism for uh, metadata improvement. And we have had some successful examples of sort of uh, giving information back to the metadata provider. An example would be we work pretty closely with ISSN and we can uh, work, you know, uh, mining the ISSN data, uh, finding the journal homepages that are in there, archiving those pages. And in some cases, the website has moved or it's redirecting to a new location. And we can give that information back uh, to ISSN and they can update their, their records. So there's a little reciprocal, reciprocal metadata enhancement, I think, that has been uh, one success of the project. Um, so what are the components? Just to talk a little bit about the technology, uh, we sort of have a lot of content and crawling and processing infrastructure. Uh, we are consuming all these APIs uh, daily and then launching uh, web crawls around them, either for singular artifacts like individual PDF URLs or seeding larger crawling initiatives for like a whole journal website and things like that. Uh, we're not just looking at PDFs. We're, of course, dealing with HTML only publications uh, in XML as well. All of this content gets matched with the metadata that has driven the archiving endeavor. So in many cases, that's, of course, a bibliographic record that is a DOI. Uh, we, of course, are also creating bibliographic records, uh, extracting data from PDF or from HTML to create the equivalent of a DOI record uh, that we can then use. Um, and all of this uh, gets matched. Uh, the, the web crawls, of course, go into the larger Wayback Machine collection. And then uh, the bibliographic metadata goes into this uh, fat cat big catalog uh, backend system uh, that marries basically the archived content in the archive and the bibliographic metadata. And then the search and discovery layer on top of that is uh, IA Scholar, which is at scholar.archive.org. Uh, Here's the little diagram. We use a number of different harvesting technologies, both browser-based, link-based, uh, and sort of manually driven. Goes into the Wayback Machine, gets analyzed as part of all this, uh, and then goes into the catalog. So when dealing with PDFs, uh, we have a couple of different machine learning tools that we use. One is to identify PDFs in any crawl. Now we of course have crawls that are directed towards scholarly material intentionally. Journal websites are, uh, URLs from DOIs or however else. Um, but of course, we also have generic web crawls that we're just conducting as part of our web archiving. And so we have a tool that can basically look at any PDF and uh, identify or make a guess or an informed guess, a machine informed guess uh, as to whether it is a scholarly output or a research paper. And it is pretty good at that. So uh, that happens first. If it is, then it goes to Grobid, which is a uh, not something we developed, but we have uh, contributed uh, code to the project, uh, which basically works with PDFs to extract bibliographic metadata and full text uh, and put it into XML. Uh, so that's useful. Uh, if it doesn't match an existing identifier, we use a tool called uh, Fuzzy Cat, which we did build, which is uh, doing fuzzy matching to try to say, does it, does it match a DOI or some PID? Um, knowing the author and the title and maybe the, some part of the abstract. Um, so there's a little fuzzy matching. And if it doesn't, then we just create our own record. And that is what goes into the catalog. What does that look like? We're doing about 40,000, uh, archiving about 40,000 scholarly objects a day. Um, most of those are PDFs or papers, but of course there's also data sets and protocols and uh, conference proceedings and things that are not um, the traditional journal article publication. Uh, we're of course getting feeds, not just from DOIs and ArcSiv and PubMed and things like that, but many others. Uh, to date, we have around 170 million PDFs processed. This, as I mentioned, is a lot less than is in way back going back historically, but that's since we started this intentional project and it's about uh, 240 terabytes overall. Uh, we do, you know, a lot of that is, is OA journal homepages, of course. Uh, the, the sort of PID signals that I already mentioned, 
as well as a URL list and manifest sharing with places like Unpaywall, Semantic Scholar. Um, we're also, of course, hitting every OAI PMH feed uh, that we can find to try to discover more content there too. Uh, so there, of course, is a somewhat complex catalog data model that is sort of Ferber-ish for those who uh, are into that sort of thing. Um, it gets very complex. And then, of course, there are many versions of a single article. There's uh, the preprint, potentially multiple preprints. There's the author's copy. There's the pre-publication version, which someone might be able to put onto their faculty homepage on their university website. Uh, there's the version of record, there's the retracted, updated version of record. Uh, so, uh, so that's just for the article. Of course, then we're also trying to find data sets, protocols, uh, conference talks, whatever else might be out there that is associated with that. Um, so it gets, it gets pretty complex. And then we try to make uh, evaluative decisions of what is, the, uh, what is the one that should be highlighted in search and discovery uh, uh, things. Uh, of course, we're associating all the metadata from these external things as well. Uh, so there's a very complex data model around that. Uh, of course, a lot of this is web captures as well, which adds extra complexity because there is a landing page, which might have the abstract and some other information on it, as well as, of course, the PDF that is embedded there. Uh, the, any web capture is actually multiple individual files, the CSS, the JavaScript, the HTML, the PDF. So it, get, it can get pretty complex pretty fast, but of course we're trying to abstract all that away. Um, we do have a public ability to look at the coverage per journal, mostly for internal use, but it is queryable. So trying to do coverage dashboards by uh, journal or, or by other uh, sort of filters is something. Accidentally muted there. I mentioned the edit stream uh, and that people are actively editing and submitting edits Wikipedia style to our metadata catalog. So that's been a, a important aspect of the work as well. Uh, just the final numbers for, for the last couple of slides about partnerships and products. I think we have about 180 million research outputs. These numbers are gonna get a little fuzzy because sometimes it's hard to identify things with uh, absolute determination uh, at, this, at this scale. And especially with the uh, two to three people that are working on this project, uh, but about 120 million papers. Uh, papers can, of course, be a conference proceeding. It might occasionally be sort of gray literature. Uh, it includes a lot. Uh, but IA Scholar, the discovery layer, is very highly uh, known and identified and uh, verified works that are open with full text. So we're at about 32 million uh, open access scholarly articles uh, with full text uh, and a lot of metadata uh, for, for search and discovery. Um, we think about a little less than half of those actually have no known uh, digital preservation solution currently. Uh, we are uh, we're archiving sort of the keepers registry, which I'll talk about a little bit later, um, or comparing against the keepers registry or uh, other known digital preservation sources. So this is not a, a we're sure it's 14 million, uh, but I think uh, it's it's definitely a pretty big number of those, and that's uh, I think a good good outcome of the project is that we have provided preservation infrastructure at a relatively low cost for a relatively high number uh, of of OA papers and journals. Um, we're also starting to include some of the digitized material within Internet Archive within the the IA Scholar project. Uh, that's sort of ongoing. We had started basically all born digital and from the web. Uh, but we're starting to add more uh, more scholarly, open scholarly material from other sources. If you're interested in the tech stack, it's a relatively large Elasticsearch index. It's a pretty big Postgres SQL database, but for the most part, it's only using a couple of medium-sized VMs. So it's just not infrastructurally, it's not a huge uh, project, uh, though it is you know a couple hundred terabytes of data, uh, at least in the archive. I won't do a live demo because that would be that would be dangerous, but scholar.archive.org, please go check it out. Contact me or any of us with any uh, feedback. We launched it, I think, in Q2 or so. So it's about six months and there's a fair amount of continued UI work and other features that we want to do. Uh, but I think it's uh, it's pretty good and pretty responsive for the, for the maturity of the project, which is early maturity. Uh, what else is in there? Uh, we have uh, are just released a, a relatively large uh, citation graph product. 
And the intent of that was to find all the citations within the corpus and make sure that they were linked to other content in Internet Archive. Uh, so if there's a web URL in a paper citation, uh, we have extracted the citation and we have linked it to the Wayback Machine capture. We, uh, and I have some stats on this later. Uh, there's plenty of command line utilities, open APIs, and both data sets that I'll talk about as well a little. What are we working on currently? We're trying to focus especially on non-PDF version of record data, so, uh, or articles or outputs. Um, so this is HTML only publications, uh, which are pretty complex to archive uh, and to know whether you're archiving well. We're doing a lot of data sets, both through uh, mirroring data repositories, but also through partnerships and development like that. Um, trying to look at secondary scholarly outputs like protocols and conference talk videos uh, and other things that uh, are associated with the original article, um, but are on other platforms, uh, you know, SlideShare, YouTube, things like that. Uh, we have some tools for people to be able to submit their own papers uh, for, for automated crawling, uh, expanding full text search, expanding citation integrity, and, and bulk data sharing. Some of the partnerships, I wanted to highlight a couple that I'm short on time, so I'll go pretty quickly. Uh, uh, we are working with uh, Directory of Open Access Journals, PLOX, the public knowledge uh, project, which runs OJS as, and the ISSN and Keepers Registry around Project Jasper. This allows uh, smaller OA nonprofit journals that are in DOAJ to basically submit their content for preservation instead of us going out uh, and crawling it. And they do that as part of their submitting their article metadata uh, to DOAJ. So it's trying to get preservation upstream to where the journals themselves are already doing things uh, instead of having to think of preservation uh, at the end of the process. So I'm pretty excited about that and we'll, there'll be more news on that next year. Uh, we're also working with Center for Open Science and their OSF platform to basically have an integration so that things in uh, OSF are automatically archived uh, in Internet Archive. So we have started with research registrations and hope to expand that. So that's uh, sort of thinking about open science and open knowledge preservation, not just from articles, but also, of course, from data uh, and other things like research registrations that might not be traditionally thought of as a scholarly output. Um, I should note that we did ask Google Scholar if we could call the project IA Scholar, so we did not steal the name. Uh, we have a good relationship with Google, and we are uh, haven't announced it yet, but our IA Scholar is indexed in Google Scholar, and we're expanding that. And we started with uh, about 18 to 20 million. So excited! Uh, everybody uses Google Scholar, so it's great to great to have your stuff there. So excited about that partnership. Also, we are joining the Keepers Registry, so we'll start publishing our preservation holders, our preservation holdings in the Keepers format. Uh, with the, I think, 12 to 14 other keepers. So I'm excited about that. And then we've been working pretty closely with the Semantic Scholar Project uh, in sharing uh, code mostly, but also some, some seed list and things like that. Also, Inter uh, Internet Archive is, is working on interlibrary loan and exploring some interlibrary loan pilots. Uh, and our uh, Internet Archive Scholar material is included in that. So I think uh, it's another great access mechanism to actually get into the ILL systems. Uh, so that's that's an exciting one. I mentioned the citation graph. It's about 1.3 billion citations. We matched 14 million things to way back, 20 million to digitized books that are in IA's open library program, uh, and a whole lot of uh, stuff matched to, wik to archived Wikipedia pages. Uh, so we just released it uh, last month, and I'm excited to see uh, what scholars or data miners can do with uh, a relatively large citation corpus. Uh, and then we do have a number of sample data sets for people to use uh, if interested. Uh, the last thing I'll mention is product development. And we have been working on this throughout the project uh, with many of our institutional partners that might already use other Internet Archive services. Uh, but I'm excited to see how this can work in the OA and scholarly communications and sort of open infrastructure, open science uh, communities. We're obviously already working with many journals, either through like uh, the Project Jasper style, style uh, partnerships are directly to have them either deposit or make sure that we're archiving their things well. So we can offer, of course, pretty easy and low cost and even free preservation services to journals. 
Uh, we can also, if they don't have persistent identifiers, we can help them get persistent identifiers, uh, which is uh, important to have their information more discoverable in our system and other systems. Uh, for institutions, we've had interesting conversations around, we have a lot of scholarly material from your institution. Uh, do you want it? Um, it is obviously challenging for many to convince their own researchers to deposit into their institutional repository. And hopefully we can help some uh, universities uh, get content they might not be getting through faculty deposit or things like that. Many of them also, of course, archive their websites using our web archiving services. And we can, of course, analyze, uh, use these same processes to analyze their own web archive collections uh, and extract uh, scholarly material for that. And for researchers, um, you know, providing systems where they can deposit uh, some of these harder to archive uh, outputs of their work, be it protocols or conference talks or videos of demos or multimedia material, things like that. Uh, and of course, provide data sets out of the project uh, that they can use in their own in their own analysis. So that's it, 25 minutes. Um, I did want to give a shout out to the project engineers, Brian Newbold and Martin Steigen, and also a shout out to David Rosenthal and Vicki Reich, who many of you know, who have helped with the project. And we have gotten support for this through Andrew W. Mellon Foundation and from IMLS. So thank you, of course, to them as well. And that's it. Thanks. I see three chats, so I can try to let's see, open the chat box. Yep, you, you've got chat. you've got a question in the chat, Jefferson. Okay, thank you, Michael. Are you drawing content from other long-term archiving systems such as Locks, Portico, in addition to Clocks? We have a clock incident in Berlin. Are there too many legal complications? How active is the collaboration with Keepers Registry? Uh, yeah. And, so and I'll just work. give a footnote on that that yeah. question that um, I am very much involved in long term archiving here in Germany, and the legal complications are, are clearly um, a major problem. So your list of collaborators is interesting, and I'm wondering whether you're hitting those legal issues as well. Uh, haven't hit them too much yet. Um, we are expecting that. Uh, uh, a number of the key, so we have joined Keepers officially. We haven't announced it yet or published our mm -hmm. first Keep Art report yet, but that'll happen uh, next month, I think. Um, uh, and through the Keepers that are involved in the project Jasper, there is the discussion of how we can distribute the data that is deposited there via many, anyone who wants to preserve it essentially. So we mm -hmm. do have integrations with locks and clocks for content sharing directly. Um, that has mostly been from Internet Archive to them so far, we would of course be happy to take any content that is, you know, licensed legitimate or legally viable to be deposited with us. Um, I think we have done that in some small cases, not as intentionally for scholarly material. Uh, cert certainly with, we've worked a lot with lots of course over the years mm -hmm. and have done content sharing, but that wasn't always necessarily scholarly material or scholarly articles. Right. I know so David I think and this Vicky is a, are working with you. Yep, and um, I think there's a lot of potential for there. For material that can be widely distributed for preservation at many institutions, uh, I think all, all of these uh, parties are interested in doing that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Good question. Um, <clears throat> I know it's very early days, Jefferson, but um, one of the things that I've been watching um, <clears throat> is uh, the the um, move to make the Internet Archive one of the keepers that are covered in the keepers registry and your participation in the Jasper project. Um, uh, I think Jasper is a really important response to the obvious um, uh, missing material in the Keeper's Registry that's um, open, you know, the long tail of open access publishing, um, uh, journal publishing. And I'm just wondering if you can give us any um, insight into how that's going so far. 
Sure. So certainly, uh, you know, I think one of our goals, if I didn't mention it, was explicitly to focus on long tail at risk and on the web. Uh, we have, things on the web are at, at risk of disappearing quickly. And as I mentioned, the long tail really doesn't have the, the people resources or the financial resources to think about digital preservation much. So yeah. uh, certainly the long tail and the non uh, the nonprofit, the non-commercial, as well as the non-Europe, North America has been a something we've been very explicit about focusing on. I also like the, the Jasper project because um, so getting preservation where people live instead of making it either, it has to be the outreach of the preserving entity that's trying to do outreach communications and um, you know that is challenging or expecting that people will come through the front door is also sort of challenging. Uh, Jasper has been, success it is very early stage. We have integrations between all the partners. So that happened within the last couple of months. Um, the, it, has the, it is in, we, it's still in pilot, uh, but all the technology on the DOAJ site for people to deposit their open access material for it to be distributed amongst the players for preservation and for us to report that, of course, in our own keepers reports, but also back to the to the uh, to the publishers is is done. I would say you know we're sort of at the maybe ten or a dozen participant participating journals so far. Mm -hmm. So it's a very early stage because a lot of those systems were just built in the last couple of months. Uh, but I think pretty successful. And I think at least our goal, and I think the goal of other some of the others is how can we do a project Jasper anywhere, like for any. Right. This is very. They have to be. People have to be nonprofit OA journal in DOAJ. Uh, so, and that is, uh, I think, the qualifying journal. I forget the exact number, but I think it's about seven thousand. So it's a it's a pretty significant. Yeah. Plus within DOAJ. Yeah. Uh, but can we just apply that model to other to other, you know, directories or registry services or other open infrastructure? services that journals are already working with. And I think, uh, so I think it's a, it's not just a great project, but it's a good blueprint for yeah. uh, making it easier for the, for the long tail to, to make sure that they're preserved. Yeah, and a tremendously good fit with Internet Archive's capabilities. Um, so anyway, thank you for that update. I think we are about at time. Um, I really appreciate you coming to, I mean, there's just a huge amount of information in these slides and uh, you're obviously doing uh, an awful lot of wonderful work on behalf of our community. So thanks so much for coming to update it. Um, really appreciate yes, it. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for letting us talk. And if anyone is interested in partnering or more information, definitely reach out. All right. And now we're going to take a short break till um, about uh, 2.30 Eastern time. So about seven minutes or so. So um, see you then.